So when it comes to your personal brand, it all comes down to your goals. Well, hello and welcome to the Leverage Through Podcast. This is the show that helps you leverage the talent and tactics of high performers. I'm Craig Shoemaker, and today's guest is Adrian Shears. Adrian specializes in helping leaders use social PR to unleash their expertise and attract opportunities they deserve. And as the owner of VVMA Labs, she provides coaching, corporate training, workshops, and strategic counsel. And let me tell you, the world has noticed she's been featured in AARP Magazine, ABC News, Ad Week, PR Week, and now the Leverage Tree Podcast. Adrian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm so delighted to be able to, to meet with you. We kind of met in a, a, a group based off of a cohort that we we're in. And uh, it's like the best thing to be able to, to meet fun, interesting, and high-performing people here on social media. Yeah, it's been wonderful to get to know other people in the group and see what everyone does and seeing what you're doing on Twitter. So I'm very honored to be here. That's awesome. So your your specialty is PR and branding. And I, I thought I'd kind of start by digging into it. what's the difference between the two if there is a difference. So a lot of people think PR is simply media relations. PR is actually like managing the relationship between an organization and its stakeholders and the public. So a brand is a part of that. A brand can be your reputation, but reputation is more so what you do. Um, A brand is your intentional promotion of that. Uh, It could be a reputation, but it's also what you want to be known for. And so when I say social PR, I'm simply using the definition of public relations and using social media as the way that it shows up. So meaning I'm using social channels to do the work of public relations. So you can show up in a press release, right? You can share your PR via press release. You can do it through awards, speaking engagements, and you can also do it through social media. Okay. So it sounds like there's a lot of intent that goes into building this the right way. And when you're working with your clients, what sort of mindsets or what sort of things do you want people to be thinking about in order to to do this correctly? Well, the first is like, what is their goal? Why are we even doing this? The second (laughs) is what are they known for? What's unique about them? And this is, I guess, for individuals or organizations, what is your differentiator? And then the third, what do you want to be known for? So it's one thing to be different, but if nobody knows what that differentiating factor is, that's not very helpful. And then the last is how do you want to show up? And so that also will go back to the goals. If you're trying to, for example, I have organizations that are in policy, they need their communication or they need their brand to be in front of policymakers, influencers, movers and shakers. So they need to get to those gatekeepers, other people, it's publications that those gatekeepers respect. So they get that, I call it third party credibility. It's one thing to be like, mm-hmm. I'm awesome. It's another thing if Craig, if you're like, <laughs> I'm awesome, people are like, okay, I'm more inclined to agree with Craig because of course, Adrian's going to say she's awesome. She's very biased. Right. She has every incentive in the world <laughs> to think she's awesome. Craig, not so much. It would ruin his reputation <laughs> if he um, is just promoting anybody and everybody. So it's right. really always going to come back to those goals. And so what I like to do is really get into strengths. So when it comes to organizations, some have really great data And so they can tell really great stories and do something different than everybody else. So in the news cycle, you don't want a lot of everybody saying the same thing. You want someone who maybe is bringing a different perspective and a different perspective could be um, rooted in data or supported by data. For example, SparkToro, it is an audience intelligence software and they partner with different organizations all the time to get some data and it generally um, is satisfying a news point. Um, I remember one time uh, when Elon Musk had just bought Twitter, it was a whole news cycle of 
he was talking about, oh, Twitter, it's full of bots. And so Spark Toro was like, hmm, how many bots are there? So they partnered with <laughs> an organization that I guess could figure it out. And they were able to calculate a percentage of Twitter that were bots. And so everybody was talking about Twitter and bots and what have you, but only Spark Toro actually was like, and here's the the proof point, or here is the actual information. So it's taking the story to a next level. So that's something as an audience intelligence software made sense. And they also use their resources, which was all of the partnerships. So kind of seeing what uniqueness do you have that could add to the story, but also add value. That is probably the most important thing. Nobody mm. cares about you. Nobody necessarily cares about your organization. If you're like a brand with big fandom, okay, they do care. But for everybody else, do they care? So you have to really bring more value to the public than you are to yourself. Well, and I, I think it's interesting in, in terms of bringing value and being able to recognize what's valuable. Mm. And so what are some of the criteria? Like, because we could talk about ourselves, we could talk about how we're different or whatever, but what sort of signals are you looking for in order to, to find response on that? That's a great question. So you need to understand your audience. And one thing I say is do not make assumptions about them. What you can do is you can do a couple things. You can do social listening to see what they're talking about, seeing what seems to drive them, what they're, you know, kind of chirping about. You can also ask them. I like to do focus groups um, when for my own business, when I'm creating a new offering, I'm talking to people. I'm not making an offering in a vacuum. I'm like, hey, I'm coming up with this. Is this helpful to you? Would you pay for it? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's amazing. Or like, mm, no. And people <laughs> are tend to be polite. <laughs> so they may not directly tell you no, but they may not be enthusiastic. I'll give um, an example. So last year, I had two ideas. I either was going to help social media um, departments refresh their social media marketing doing like an intense VIP day and we're getting in there, we're getting granular and we're seeing what's going on with social because social is just changing and these poor social media marketers are just being inundated. So I was going to come in mm. and we were going to just mm, fix things. So that got some response, but with the economy, with um, different things going on, it became clear that people were like, oh yeah, that's nice. But then when I started talking about social PR and helping brand leaders increase their visibility, increase their credibility using social PR, I sold it before it even launched. So that yeah. to me was like, okay, that that is great feedback. So really understanding what your audience likes, what they care about, what they need is really important. Another thing people like to do is Reddit really seeing what conversations are going on on Reddit, Yelp, whatever your business or topic is, go where people are talking about that. So that is your first clue. Right. And then really understanding, like if you're a service-based business, what type of things do they need? What type of challenges are frequently coming up? How are you alleviating those challenges? And that's how you're really going to find value because people care about themselves and the value could be helping them do their job better, helping them feel better, helping them feel seen, helping them laugh. It could be a lot of things, but you just really need to right. understand or helping them seem smart. You really just need to understand what are their motivators and then you can gotcha. see what makes sense for you. So how, how do you know when you've talked, maybe not know when you've talked enough, but what do you feel like is a good sample size? Let's say you're doing a focus group or in-person meetings. How many people do you want to chat with? That's a good question. It depends <laughs> as all marketing does. For some, <laughs> I'll just do a couple of focus groups for the conversations that I had. I just am always having conversations. And if I'm getting hot energy, I'll just be like, okay, this is it. So I think it's like trusting your gut. Sometimes it's like three to five people. I know businesses will like to do 10 to 12. It, it really is going to depend on how much is at stake 
I think if it's like a small initiative, talking to a few people and it's not a high lift, fine. If it's something that's going to be, you know, multi-million dollar investment, okay, now we need to actually, you know, get a proper sample size of customers right. and, you know, maybe do a survey and, you know, have it, you know, be larger. But if it's something like, okay, a new, um, you know, podcast for yourself, you know, you could probably just talk to a few people who are, once again, most importantly, your audience. One thing I see a lot of, of excuse me, people um, becoming coaches and they're talking to people who don't hire coaches about what they would like in a coach. And that's a little counterintuitive because they don't value coaching. They will never hire you. They don't believe in coaching. So um, I had one woman talking to me about, oh, she thinks she's too expensive, but she was talking to people who don't hire coaches. And so I gave her some of my friends. They love a good coach. So they're actually, quite frankly, <laughs> banned from hiring any more coaches because they need to just do and not be coached anymore. It's time I'm to go. I'm trying to help you out here. Just no more coaching. No, Please, no. Stop. Like she's literally banned. <laughs> Literally, because right. she loves learning and she loves, you know, the interaction and the encouragement. Right, yeah. And I'm like, that is great. But at a certain point, you need to actually do it. Um, <laughs> and the coach can't help you. You need to do it. And then you can get a coach later, but you need no right. more coaches. So who your actual audience is. And I'm, I'm doing a project coming up. We're going to launch um, for a client a new a social network. We don't know which one. And so we're going to create a survey and that's going to go, they have a huge email list. So that's going to go out to thousands of people in some communication of, you know, what social networks do they personally like, or where would they like uh, the company to show up? And then also a little, um, some customer interviews. I think we're going to do about eight, um, five to eight to just get a feel okay. of like, the qualitative of what they're looking for and kind of having some conversations. And if we get a lot of different responses, then we might do more because we're not, um, it's too varied, but generally mm, what I look for point, yeah. when people start saying the same thing or you start getting the same patterns, it's like, okay, we're, we're good to go. That that's when you've dialed it in. Mm. All right. Do you want to play a game with me? Sure. All right, so we're going to play one, two, three, okay? And so uh, thinking in terms of building, let's say, a personal brand for someone, it can be any market, any expertise, doesn't, you get to pick who, who we're dealing with here, okay? Okay. But you get to work with one social media network, you have okay. two months to work with them, and they're going to put in three hours a day in order to build their brand. Ooh. What's the strategy? What do we do here? Okay, so three hours a day, I can pick it's one social network. One social network, and, and we're looking to, to kind of quantitate or look at results in about two months. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to choose LinkedIn, since that okay. is my book. <laughs> um, I'm also going to choose someone who is a personal finance expert. Maybe they're a financial advisor or financial planner. Um, and they specialize in financial planning for women. Okay. Um, cause I, I'm biased cause I really like that topic. Um, right. <laughs> so they can spend three hours a day. So this is my perfect person. So they are uh, good at video <laughs> and they are good at, um, they're very passionate and they're very well read. And so what the strategy would be was, accessible, fun finance tips, because unfortunately women too often will be opting out of personal finance. So it's really important for this to be fun and accessible. And hey, even if you weren't good at math, this is for you. And so what I would do or encourage her to do is really capture her voice because she's an awesome rock star who is approachable and her clients love her hands on. So we're going to want to highlight that. So we're going to do a couple of things. The first thing we're going to do is have video of frequently asked questions and really short bite-sized tips of 
common problems that people have of like monthly budget to investing and then really targeting it towards the recession because apparently this recession is a coming. I, I put it in quotes <laughs> because it's been a coming and no one has said anything. So we got that. And then we're going to also encourage people to ask questions and that's going to fuel her content of what do people actually want to know? And she's going to create really quick 60 second videos, maybe three to five minute ones that are a little more complex and, you know, have multiple steps, but at least weekly, a short video and maybe a longer video. We're also going to go to different LinkedIn groups and join conversations because social is not just about posting. So she's going to grow mm -hmm. to, we're going to find different women's organizations. We're going to find um, maybe different groups that are relevant, but we're not going to spam people about the services. We're going to join the conversation authentically. Oh, and I'm going to rewind it back. We're going to make sure the LinkedIn headline says exactly what she does empowering women mm. to level up their finances, probably better than what I just said, but very, very clear of what it is. So when right, in that she, vein. It, right, whenever she's commenting, people know exactly. And in the book, those who are curious will want to follow her. Then to get some media attention, we're going to look at the news and in the news, we're going to see, um, look at things with the recession, buying, that's going to be our jam. And what she's going to do is do different data points. So whether she has access from her company and kind of write um, a carousel or um, maybe a longer post with those quick and dirty stats so that the media knows that she's an expert. And fortunately for her, LinkedIn is where the journalists are heading. For those of you who aren't mm. aware, Twitter... I'm um, going through some things. And so <laughs> the, to put it lightly, <laughs> the most popular network, uh, Muck Rected, a state of journalism report or state of media report. Journalists had intended to spend more time on LinkedIn than any other social network um, in 2023. So she's going to make sure she's there. Her profile will already be optimized and she's going to be sharing those tips so that when the media is looking for a source, we can find them or they can find her we're also going to do some pitching and introduce herself. So we're also going to look on LinkedIn for those active reporters and see what, but not everything has to be social. We'll probably just make a list of who her targets are, AKA the people more likely to want her as a source or cover her. And we're going to pitch them directly because we're going to maybe have some content that they're going to find relevant that they could perhaps build a story around and how we're going to measure. So we're going to measure and see, A, are followers increasing? Are inquiries increasing? Are we going to see um, requests from the media? And that might be a little harder because you can't really control the media. But what you can look for is podcast interviews, you know, trade publications, they are always, always needing content as our journalists. So we'll probably have different tiers, but really looking for that um, increase in invisibility. And I think last, that's very overlooked. People are looking at new people, new customers. But what I found is a personal brand can actually reinvigorate your current network. For myself, I've been posting on LinkedIn more. And so I have family members who are on LinkedIn and they're now like introducing me to people or like, oh, I loved your uh -huh. content. And I realized, you know, that I was kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so now people are like, oh, you do this. I can loop you in with so-and-so. So you're really um, looking for things to go up. I just did a LinkedIn Live with the amazing Rand Fishkin. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Um, he has a book called like Lost and Founder. And he's the CEO of Spark Toro. And one piece of advice he gave is don't focus so much on attribution. Attribution and measurement are two different things. Attribution is we can say without a doubt, this customer came from a Google ad. Now with changes um, 
to tracking. It's much harder to do that. And we also know that brand building, we also know that brand building helps other marketing actions, but they're very hard to measure. And so these right. things that I just said can be a little harder to measure. How do I know that someone has more trust? How do I know that more people are considering me? You can't know exactly, but what you're going to start to look for is those qualitative things. We're going to look for who are those people who are now following me? You're going to want them to be women. You're going to want them to be women who have jobs that I guess could afford a financial expert. And you're also going to be looking for journalists to be following you because they need sources and you want to be looked at as credible. And then you're going to look at, okay, I'm getting more of this. I'm getting more of that. So it's a little bit of a, a correlation game, I like to call it. And so that would be yeah. my my essential dream. Someone who has three hours a day for content, That that's amazing. I love it all. <laughs> well, I think uh, we're going to have to not publish this podcast and just turn this into your masterclass on how to do branding <laughs> because that was like incredible amount of detail and strategy. Um, so two, two things occur to me and I'm going to ask them both at the same time and, and we can you know do whichever one first you want. And that is, what does it look like to pitch a, uh, a, a journalist? Like, how do you do it correctly? And with our, our friend that we're working with here, what's a mistake that she could make during this process that could sabotage all the good stuff she's trying to do? Oh, right. Yeah. I like this. Good questions. Um, so I would <laughs> say how you do it it's not rocket science, but you also have to be aware of the industry. The news or media industry has been cut. There's not as many people covering stories and they're covering lots of beats. They may not just be covering one, they may be covering five and they're inundated by email. But the good news, mm. they're inundated by a lot of bad emails. <laughs> so if you're on message, you're <laughs> already head and shoulders above the rest, but you do have the large possibility that it will not be seen. And so when I pitch, I like to be short and sweet and to the point. Hi, who I am, why you should be interested and what I offer. So I had a piece or I wanted to do an op-ed about measurement um, because PR people, social media people aren't known for their math skills. So I wanted to talk about how um, they could improve that. And so I did a really quick subject line of the proposed title of what was it? Math phobic. I use the word math phobic or like three tips for math phobic okay. PR people. So it's like a fun little title, you know, whatever. And I'm like, hi, I'm Adrian. I do this. The reason why I'm pitching you. So kind of making some reference to, what they've covered before. So you're not like, oh, I'm covering, you know, we talked to a finance right, person okay. for our friend. We're not going to reach out to a person who talks about the environment um, unless I guess we can tie fi personal finance to the environment. So why you're contacting them. And then like the, you know, the quick three things that you have to offer, like bullet points, definitely bullet points because they're going to scan and do a little quick thing of, why this would be valuable to their readers because they're not in the business of promoting you. They do not work for you. Their value is to their readers. So if you can show a connection and why this would be valuable to your readers, like women, you know, I see most of your readers are women and women are 30% behind retirement compared to men or have 30% less savings to men. These tips will, you know, increase the shrink the gender gap in retirement savings. You know, if you'd like to chat with me, here I am. The last thing I'll say is do not include any attachments because you get caught in spam filters. Remember, you are a stranger so that they do not know that <laughs> who you are. And if you're sending like a big <clears throat> pile of, uh, um, but you can, <laughs> you can link to things. So I like to link to, if you're asking to, you know, write an op-ed, link to a blog post that shows you can write. Like I've written something similar here. Um, if it's broadcast, a video of you speaking to show that you can actually do that. Um, 
giving that. And then also don't follow up a million times because they're busy. So maybe following up once after like a week or two is enough. And then another thing you can do is just introduce Mm -hmm. yourself like, hey, I see this, you know, whatever. And another thing that's really great is recommending someone else that's not you. So they need a lot of people for the story sometimes. And so, hey, I'm good at personal finance. This person is great at investing. I think you should contact them. You're making their job easier because they need to find sources. When I was in college or grad school, I interned in a newsroom and one of the editors would just be screaming throughout the day, find me a story, (laughs) somebody find me a story. I need a source. (laughs) So they're really looking, they are looking for people. Um, They just are annoyed that they're just being inundated by just crap. So if you can be the non-crap, and then also check in on them. See how they're doing. Like, hey, so sorry, it was wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And don't ask for anything. Like, just yeah. form relationships. No, that's, that's great. I mean, it comes down to just treating people like humans, like you're saying, making their life easier. How to win friends and influence people. Like, that's my favorite book in the world. <laughs> yes, it's just, it, it is. And, you know, don't take it personally if they don't write back. There are journalists like um, that have their own sub stacks now. Um, mm. be- so they will say like, hey, I'm looking for this and, you know, whatever. So they have like a newsletter. So subscribe to those. I follow reporters on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, there is sources you could use like Harrow, help a reporter out. Right. And um, I think quoted the caveat with those is because of A.I., I've seen reporters just like they're just inundated by fake pitches, by robots, and it's clogging their inbox. So it is a challenge, but it's definitely if you keep coming different people with quality stuff over time, the the chips will fall. Is it worthwhile to ever ask them a question in order to try and spark that, that human connection? Or is it really just more like, okay, here's what I can do for you if you need to need it. I'm here. You could ask like, what would be helpful? I work in this industry um, and I cover the following areas or, you know, I work in the following areas. What would be helpful for you? Um, Mm -hmm. Because they may be like, hey, I, you know, because you think about it. If you have clients, your clients are sources to them too, because they might want the practitioner side, but they also may want the actual person side, the person who actually is struggling to, to, Right. Save for retirement. So I think that, but I think like a random question, they might be a little too busy for that. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I have not personally sense. done that, but, you know, see how it works. <laughs> Trial and error. All right. So that brings us right to uh, so what sort of missteps do we want to try to avoid? Missteps would be not personalizing. Missteps would be being too salesy. So... Mm. I saw a Substack recently that was perfect. The journalist was explaining what she covers. So she's like, I'm not covering your product launch. So if you're talking about like you have a new cell phone, I'm not going to cover that. But I will cover cell phone trends. So if you have something that speaks to a trend, she's like, I would love to hear from you. But I do not want to hear about your product launch. Um, So that's some some nuances to think about. Like if you're a tutor in math. They're not going to be like, okay, you can hire Adrian for a hundred dollars an hour, $50, whatever tutor costs, you know, a math. But if you are speaking to, you know, math scores plummeting because of the COVID pandemic and how you're helping um, students, you know, tips to help students. Now that could be a story because they can talk about the kids, you know, why this is happening. And then they can get your perspective on solutions. Right. So it's like a, now a full story. What are the right. steps? Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Thinking, um, thinking they work for you is a large misstep. So it's not, they're probably not going to give you the story before it goes live. They might not even tell you <laughs> that it goes live because they're so busy. So always be <laughs> on the look. Some will verify your quote. Oh, I do have a a bit of an example now. So I actually had a focus group. It was a Gen Z focus group on 
how Gen Z uses TikTok to search. And so I had interviewed a bunch of Gen Zers, put my two cents in and insights and posted it on social. Went viral, a bunch of media found it, and the New York Times actually reached out because they had been wanting to work on a story. And so they ended up not using me. They ended up using Gen Zers for the story, which made sense. They were more compelling. Sure. But yeah. one of the Gen Zers in my focus group, few of them got to be in it. And so what I realized, though, is they, you know, they're very young, so they weren't aware of what the press is like. So things to avoid is hyperbole. If you say something mm. on the record, they're going to say it on the record. So I think someone was hyperbolic and then it printed and they're like, this makes me look terrible. I didn't mean it that mm. way. And so fortunately, the journalists like kind of retracted a little bit, but it's like the reporter is not your friend. They are a, you know, they're beholden to their readers. They need to have the clicks and everything. So joking around being hyperbolic Taken out of context, it could make you look a little not what you want. So yeah. thinking thinking uh, through of whatever you're saying is on the record unless they say it's not on the record. And if you say this is not on the record, you need to wait for them to confirm you're not on the record. You saying it's, this is not on the record and then saying it. They never agreed. So. Interesting. OK, yeah, it's, it's like those things that we learn throughout life uh, by watching TV that you think it's one way and reality is, is very much different. Mm -hmm. So I, this kind of leads me to the next thing I want to ask you when you're dealing with presenting yourself in public, there's almost two sides of a spectrum where you want to present your authentic self. And also you want to maybe portray a persona and where do you fall in the lines of that? Like, do you mix the two? Is it really like you're just playing this part so that you can achieve something for someone? What's your advice there? I say being yourself is the easiest because um, it takes a lot less effort. I think you just need to decide how you want to show up. And what I mean by that. The social media, especially um, everything is on the record. So whatever you tweet or whatever you put on LinkedIn is actually fair game. So I actually, you know, made fun of a brand on social and my tweet's an adage. I didn't ask, no one asked me. <laughs> it oh, no. just put it there. <laughs> now I'm fine with it. I stand by it. It is what it is. But I think I have another friend when Roe v. Wade happened, she tweeted her reaction that got in the news. She was not happy because she doesn't wow. want when people Google to know her opinions on Roe v. Wade. That's not what she wants associated with her business. So what I say is how you show up, meaning if it's on Google, if a client sees it, how are you going to feel if they decide not to work with you? If you're like, you know what? They needed to know that because we wouldn't be aligned if they walk away. You know, if they didn't know we would have been aligned misaligned versus, oh, I don't want people to know that. That's not like what I want people to know for work purposes. They don't share that. So you just need to decide because um, I do think there's a value in having your values and having your principles and having the people you work with be aligned with that. Um, there's mm -hmm. certain things that I'm just not going to talk about. I don't get too deep into politics on social, mainly because that is not what my work is. But maybe there are a few topics that I'm like, you know what? I stand by this 100%. And if you don't want to work with me because of it, I don't want to work with you either. And I'm perfectly right. okay with that. Well, thanks so much for all that you've shared. One of the things I like to do here at the end of the show is give you an opportunity to share like three actionable tips that people can take away from this. And I, I don't know, it seems like you've given so many already. So <laughs> I'm curious to find out what else you might have for us. Well, I think we'll just summarize. Um, so when it comes to your personal brand, you really need to, it all comes down to your goals because that's going to impact everything. That's going to determine your decisions, but it's also going to ground you. So if you're trying to attract a different clientele, if you're trying to establish credibility and be quoted. If you're looking to diversify your income, 
become a creator, what have you. That's going to determine the next steps of what you're going to do. Then you need to be really clear. This is number two. You need to be really clear about who you are and what's your differentiating factor. There is a ton of marketers, ton of lawyers, ton of doctors, whatever, but there's only one you and you have your own perspective. So what is that perspective? And really make sure you hone it. Now, don't feel pressure to just be the uniquest person ever. You don't need to try. You are. So just trust your gut and go on the journey and it will it will come to you. Then you need to know what do you want to be known for? Once again, your goals. So for your goals to happen, when you come up in people's mind, what are they thinking? Are they thinking, you know, podcast guest? They taking financial expert for women. It needs to be very clear. So the opportunities that you want to attract or pursue are very aligned. And so once you have those three things, that is your brand story. That is what your brand is. And so the bonus is how are you going to show up? Because the brand is lovely. However, How are people going to see it? Is it going to be in person when you're networking? Is it going to be at your job? Is it going to be on social? You need to think about those type of things. And you really want that aligned with what you're good at. If you're good at video, then that's a great thing. If you do not like video, don't force yourself to do video because you're not going to do it. You're you're not. It's time consuming. Um, It's uncomfortable and you will find every excuse in the book to not do it. So align with your strengths. So those would be my actionable tips. What are your goals? What's unique? What's your differentiating factor? And what do you want to be known for? And then bottle it up and decide how you're going to show up. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of the show. Let's continue this conversation. Feel free to connect with me on Twitter where I'm at Craig Shoemaker. So go out and have an amazing day. I hope you get a chance to find someone to love, find someone to forgive and find someone to encourage because we are most certainly not in this alone. And I'll see you again here soon on the Leverage 3 podcast.